Hi, today we are talking about Haiti. We'll be looking with three experts about the unique manifestations of fragility in the country. They will be discussing all of the different structural challenges the country faces and some possible solutions for the way forward. Joining me today is George Forio, a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome, George. Pleasure to be here. I've read some of your recent work, and you've done a gr an amazing job at going down into the very detailed, contextual specifics of insecurity and instability. I guess I would just ask you to start today by describing your diagnosis for the problems and where we find ourselves in this very uh, troubling time for the country. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Haiti is a country that faces profound governance problems. Now, that sounds like a simplistic idea. But as a practical matter, for the last two presidencies of Haiti, since 2011, in effect, we've had two national leaders who really uh, did not provide much national governance. And in fact, during those years, we saw at one point at the end of the previous president's term, uh, no elected successor. And then more recently with the late President Jovenel Moise, a parliament that was not re-elected in effect since 2019. So he spent the last 18 months of his life in effect with no structure to govern. And that has an impact on the ability of people to see government deliver. Mm. Not even talking about democratic governance, but simply deliver something. And also has a, a side effects on issues of economy in terms of jobs. The pandemic, the COVID, did not certainly help in that regard. And then more recently, we in fact have, really not in the last six months, particularly over the last year or so, a, a wave of sort of disintegration out in the streets, mm -hmm. in effect. So a wave of violence, the most notable one being probably sort of industrial scale kidnapping. But that's really in some ways just a symptom of a broader problem. I know you've thought a lot about the political process and what it would take to bring a political settlement to Haiti. Uh, can you tell us more about the sort of preconditions that you've spoken about and, and what would be necessary for, for a way forward uh, for the government? So the irony of the Haitian crisis, in effect, is that there's been a fairly active civil society movement. So this is not a society that is completely disintegrated. Governance isn't being delivered. But civil society remains quite active. Now, it has diverse views. So the challenge, in effect, now has been the last six to nine months has been to come up with a consensus among these differing views that civil society sort of represents. That's not been easy. I think, to some degree, international mediators or other actors could perhaps at least encourage a greater push uh, in that direction. So this consensus really needs to be established fairly quickly in order for the political process to move forward in a positive way. That really is a precondition to any notion of trying to address uh, violence. Uh, because otherwise, if you do it in the reverse, you end up with sort of an artificial structure that only cannot sustain any efforts, any progress that is made in the, in the security arena. Could you tell us more about the various constituencies beyond civil society uh, and the existing political actors, uh, more details about how they break down within civil society, within the political constituencies. So you have what is often a rather exaggerated, uh, described as elites, and I think this is not a particularly helpful uh, notion. You do have a, an active, small portion of society, particularly in the urban areas, that lives sort of half in Haiti, politically, culturally, and financially, and half elsewhere, in effect, their ability to move back and forth in and out of Haiti. Um, I don't think that's particularly a bad thing. The problem, however, is that that constituency itself is not particularly united at times. It represents different political views and ambitions. You also then have, at the other extreme, a large portion, particularly in the rural areas, but also in urban uh, slums, in effect, really no other way to describe it, a community, a constituency of individuals who have yet to benefit from any sense of governance, let alone economic development over the last two, two or three decades. And that constituency is not, uh, is not being addressed properly. It is growing in size. And it is in some ways one of the sources for the violence. They have nothing else 
to in some ways look at it and do. And therefore, they ultimately fall into the trap, if you will, mm. of a cycle of violence. And that's easy to, uh, and on to sustain under, under present circumstances. You then have a third constituency in some ways, which is a, um, a educated uh, sort of merchant class, uh, small, small merchants. Um, that constituency in some ways is the one that provides, if you will, the heartbeat in some ways of, of, of Haiti, but is the one that pays the price for all of the deficiencies, both of governance and violence. So I understand what you're saying about this precondition of, of a political settlement that, that is inclusive and, and lasting, and before we can ever make any real security gains. I understand you, you have a, a lot of thoughts about how we approach the security situation, both now as you work towards the political settlement, but then thereafter. And I'm very interested in this conceptual precondition that you talk about with the, f with the term gangs and, and how we think of, of criminal gangs versus militia in some other right. context, et cetera. Could you please tell me more about that? Yeah, so I think uh, when we talk about gang violence in some ways, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a term that doesn't really describe the sheer scope of what we're talking about in, in case of Haiti now. They're not just gangs, if you will, neighborhood gangs. There's a coalition, competing set of coalitions of gangs, the result of which is that large parts of the capital city, metropolitan area, Port-au-Prince, is in fact under the control of these gangs. Now, these are not, this is not a united group. As I said, this is a, a series of competing fiefdom, if you will, competing for, 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 for whatever they can extract out of the local community. There also, there's violence out in the rural areas, plus there's violence also out in the larger cities uh, outside of the capital, particularly in the north. Those constituencies, in effect, lead me to suggest that when you just describe gang violence, that actually is, is a much, it sounds like a localized effort when in effect it is a national issue. Mm. Um, it is also one that is tied very closely to Haiti's sort of open drug trafficking uh, sort of market, if you will, particularly coming in from the rest of the Caribbean and the northern part of South America, that usually moves either to the Dominican Republic, to the Bahamas, or frankly, directly to the United States. And there's also uh, arms trafficking. And here the United States has a particularly kind of tricky issue here because most of the weapons that are ultimately make, made it into the hands of Haitians are somehow legally, illegally, uh, coming from the United States. Mm -hmm. So a combination of all of that therefore leads me to conclude that, we, that the concept of simply saying gang violence and kidnapping is not enough. We need to think of this in much broadly. It, 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 it implies a number of other tools, policy tools and policy instruments than simply as a law, that a, law, a regular law enforcement approach would absolutely not address effectively. You, you've touched on something that, that you know way better than myself. This idea of the role of international assistance and international actors as part of the problem, specifically. Lots of discussions around this. Um, but we all know about the various uh, incidents there with the cholera issues and, mm -hmm. and other, other issues. W what are your thoughts on this as, as far as whether or not the international assistance has been, in fact, a driver of instability? Yeah, I actually I tend to be careful about, about the, uh, the analysis of the international community. I think as a general statement, it's fair to say that, that it hasn't delivered what international actors thought would happen in Haiti. There's no doubt about that, and one should not have any second thoughts about it. Haitians are frustrated, and I think it, it could lead to the argument, obviously, that international actors, let alone their assistance, ultimately becomes the, the driving force of a lot of the instability because they, in effect, drive the projects, they drive the outcomes, they're responsible for it, but somehow, at the end of the day, they're no longer around. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of something that could be done differently, even though it may be controversial. The UN had a peacekeeping operation uh, after 2004 until 2017. In some ways, it, it did provide some degree of, of stability. The violence came down dramatically, including gang violence, which is not a new development. But there was no leave behind, if you will. After all of these years of effort and funding and training, there was nothing really behind that was memorable that dealt not only with security issues, 
but also with governance corruption. There's an example of that, even though it's a controversial one, which is the, the outcomes of the peace process in Guatemala. Ultimately, over a period of 10 years, did generate a commission, if you will, that had sort of a connection to the United Nations system that dealt with corruption. It has fallen under hard times, but at least it was an indication of a commitment by the international community as well as by local political actors that corruption was an issue, impunity was unacceptable, and they put together at least a process that, that at least could, uh, could attack the problem. The irony in the case of Guatemala is probably almost too successful, and local politicians shut it down, in effect. In the case of Haiti, it could be done in a context of a, of a more regional initiative. People over often forget that Haiti is a member of the Caribbean community. It doesn't benefit from it very much. But CARICOM, for all of its flaws, is made up primarily of, of uh, countries that abide by democratic standards and the rule of law. It has, in fact, an interest in, in limiting uh, issues of corruption throughout the region and could probably be potentially a partner, if you will, uh, for Haiti and other actors on this issue of corruption and impunity. But that, to me, is a more positive aspect of what the international com com community can do. But all these efforts by, by the United States is included need to have a mechanism by which something gets left behind that is sustainable by Haitians themselves, mm. not some artificial mechanism that ultimately falls apart the day international actors leave the country. What do you think the best effort forward to this long-term plan would be in the immediate, short, medium, and long term? So four, four sort of phases. <laughs> Well, in some ways, the, 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 the broader part of the answer is that the United States now has in place the Global Fragility Act, of which Haiti, is in fact, is potentially one of the beneficiaries. The major virtue of the Global Fragility Act is its time span. It's not so much the dollar issue, which is important. It's the fact that it has at least a 10-year time frame. And that, I think, would be a key issue in any solution, if you will, to Haiti's crisis, which is not something that gets that gets put together uh, and has sort of a timeline of 24 months, or where this level of success is based on an outcome as to how quickly the United States gets out of the, of the environment. Instead, it has a 10-year timeline. And I think that, to me, would be the point of departure. In other words, it is not dependent on individual congressional appropriations, if you will, or particular political differences. It obviously has to be a commitment on the part of the Haitian authorities, mm -hmm. so it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. uh, but once that is in place, I think there are a lot of interesting possibilities, both in the law enforcement area, the National Haitian National Police does need support, more broadly in the area of, of corruption and impunity, as I mentioned just a moment ago. A third area is, in some ways, a major reconstruction project. As I said, better than ha what happened after the 2010 earthquake. But there are ways of doing that. And I think if the Global Fragility Act provides a, pr a broad framework that all these sort of various pieces can be, be sort of attached to, if you will, and provides a strategy rather than sort of haphazardly trying to do different things at different times. How do you think we best go about um, bringing in that humanitarian relief that, that is so needed alongside these longer-term development thinking towards the long-term. So both paying attention to the short-term, most immediate needs, but not letting that distract you to for the longer term. This is where I would return, actually, to the earlier part of our conversation, which is unless there is, in fact, a political consensus, a political compact uh, that somehow is able to, to, to have a timeline attached to it, and therefore a set of, of sort of responsibilities of what it tries to achieve over a period of nine months or whatever it is, 18 months, uh, perhaps leading to elections. That framework, that consensus, is what you attach to the kind of assistance you're talking about. Because then you have actors in society that have a, an incentive, in effect, to participate in the process, and they know where this is going, and they know that there's commitments behind it. So it's, it's in some ways, humanitarian assistance in this case, if you only limit it to uh, pre preventing deaths and further violence, you in fact have a kind of an open-ended scheme where nothing is going to change dramatically. In fact, it's going to get worse. So the political consensus becomes important because that's the structure that only is able to manage mm 
and direct and provide, in effect, direct uh, credibility to any form of assistance, including humanitarian assistance that is delivered from the, from the outside. Short of that, you, in effect, have a continuation of what we see in other countries, a further disintegration of society and governance disappearing altogether. And in fact, a completely chaotic situation where humanitarian assistance is basically designed to prevent more deaths or further movements of people, but that that's not a sustainable uh, solution. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank My you. Pleasure. George.